Okay, it has just gone five o'clock here in the UK. It's time to start the Seabor Working Group at IETF 115. I'm Barry Lieber and uh, my co-chair Christian Amsus is here, um, remote. And thanks for taking notes, Marco, as always. And Christian is also taking notes. I encourage everyone else to also get on the uh, etherpad and help out with note taking if you can. So let's get started. Note the note well, well. It um, tells you what you need to know for legal participation in the IETF. Uh, you've seen it many times already. If you have any questions, contact uh, or go look at the BCPs and contact your lawyers if you need to. If you're on site and you're not up here speaking on the microphone, please wear your mask. I see everybody is, so thank you. And um, if even if you're in the room, please get on the Meet Echo client. Uh, you can use the light client, which you get by scanning that lovely barcode up there, or sorry, that lovely QR code up there. Um, that's what uh, takes the blue sheets now. And that's it. Yes, and use, use that to uh, get in the mic queue, whether you're remote or local. Here's our agenda. I have uh, switched since the uh, previous version that was posted the first two items in order, in order to keep uh, Karstens together so we don't have to switch slides back and forth. Um, does anybody have anything they want to add to or change on the agenda? And yes, Brendan. Um, Brendan Morin, I'm just proxying for Hank here. He asked if it would be possible to move time tag and CDDL to the start. Okay, we can do that. So, although the fact that he's not here makes that questionable. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> but so that 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 thing that says A there, pretend that's C point one, and here's Hank. Oh, there he is. So we do we we'll do the order B C A D. Any other comments on the agenda? Okay, so anything else uh, that we wanna adjust on the agenda? Hearing none, that's all of my slides. So I'm gonna switch to Karsten Sauer. Do you wanna do your own slides, Karsten? No, I will switch the slides for you. Karsten's slides. Okay. Karsten, take it away. Okay. Okay, I actually have sneaked in a little additional item here. Um, we had a meeting of the user, usable formal methods proposed research group during the lunch break. There were some 40 plus people in the room, pretty active 40 plus people. And it really looks like this research group will happen. And that means we have a research group to talk to on all things formal methods. So we are going to ask them to do studies about the best way to do CDDL or something like that. That, that could be interesting. Okay, uh, but today I want to talk about time tag and CDDL evolution, and we will skip that one slide that Martin has made, but much better slide for. Next slide, please. So just to remind everyone about time tag, that document is from 2017. We registered the tags in 2018, and they are being actively used in some programming language communities. Um, so we should not really change this document a lot anymore. Uh, this was adopted as a working group item in 2021. And yeah, there's no rush to complete this. But uh, recently, we mostly have been waiting for uh, working with uh, Sedate. So Sedate is a working group that is doing the green stuff on, on the slide, um, or light blue, depending on your eyes, where you can add hints 
to an RFC 339 timestamp. And we are going to be able to transport these uh, in uh, time tag um, as well. So this is how it looks like. And for the last half year or so, we mostly have been waiting for Sedate to converge. Uh, that has uh, happened. Next slide, please. But uh, yeah, there is a problem here because uh, while Sedate was extending the time tag, with, uh, the, the RFC 3339 timestamp with new information, an implementation survey was done by one of the contributors, and he found a little problem. People are not using RFC 359 the way uh, it's saying you should use it. And the reason is that 359 was based on ISO 8601 1988 for good reasons, uh, because that was a version of 8601 that actually had been published by NIST. I don't know if they did this intentionally or unintentionally, but the document was out there in, in the wild so people could look at this without paying money. <clears throat> so they weren't actually using the 2000 version of 8601, but that had made a little change by outlawing minus in front of 00, zero colon zero, 00 for a local time offset. And suddenly something that's being used in RFC 359 no longer was allowed. Anyway, uh, we tried to get some discussion going how to handle this. Of course, when you find a bug, the best thing is to ignore it because it's not going to uh, slow down your work, but that's not what we decided to do in Sedate. Uh, so we decided to actually write up a fix that explains how uh, local offsets are actually used. And uh, that goes beyond the, the charter of the working group. Uh, so what we are now uh, doing is finding out whether the ISG will be happy with uh, doing that. Um, so Sedate has finished the working group last call of their document. And I think the content is stable. There's really not much reason to, to change it. And other groups like ECMA, TC39, Temporal um, are in sync with that. Um, so what we really should be doing is synchronize, synchronize our ISG submission um, of time tag with that of Sedate. That will take a couple of months, I don't know. Uh, but we should be doing our uh, working plus call uh, soon. Next slide. So my original plan was to have a Dash 03 ready before IETF 115 uh, live uh, intervened. Um, so one, one question that came up was whether we would manage to add a third time scale. We have uh, UTC and atom atomic time as time scales uh, in there, and we wanted to add UT1. Um, th there is a a theme here, CBO in space. CBO is used in a lot of space applications these days, so it fits to have a UT1, uh, an astronomical time definition in there, but we didn't manage to do this. It, it's a really complicated subject, so it will require some extra effort. So this will not go into this um, document. Um, also, uh, the distinction between planned and actual times will not go into this document. We have a registry, so we can always add stuff later, but we, we are not waiting for this. And there is one inconsistency that requires a PR with, before we can submit the dash or three. So I expect that to happen early uh, next week. And my recommendation would be to do the working group last call then. That was time tag questions. Okay, let's talk about CDL 2.0. So uh, that, that's a, actually a pretty bad name because it, it sounds like we are changing everything. No, we are not changing everything. Um, so in particular, we, we are trying to make sure that uh, every CDL 
uh, 1.0 document remains a valid CDDA 2.0 document. And surprisingly, almost all CDDA 2.0 documents will be valid uh, 1.0 documents. Uh, we get to that. But th there are four uh, things that are on the priority list here. We have a, I should have put that on the slide. We have a freezer document, um, CDDL freezer or something, um, that contains further items that we could pick up here, but, but haven't considered prioritized. And uh, we have a CDDL2 draft document that contains rough sketches for all these items. So let's go through, through these sketches. But if you find something in your work with CDDL that is not covered by these four items and that you would like to see fixed within the next uh, months, it would be good to say that. Okay, so this is <clears throat> one thing that we really got wrong in CDDL. Tag numbers only can be literal in CDDL 1.0, and that, that was just plain not so bright. So that's one thing we need to fix. We probably should discuss the processing model. Now we have a, an item called annotations there and, and Brandon is going to say what he's doing with annotations. Then we have the module structure, multiple CDDL modules working together to get a, a model. Uh, this requires some linguistic uh, precision uh, to separate. And finally, uh, we want to automate the whole issue of referencing stuff out of other documents, RFCs, internet drafts, probably three GPP documents because there are enough that we want to cover that, uh, but I don't have a plan for that yet. And uh, IANA references, so you can say this uh, value can be one of the values registered at IANA registry X. Okay, so let's, next slide, let's go into the non-literal tag. Number, so the, the first line is the current syntax where you actually have to have a literal uh, tag number in there. And uh, the proposal is to change this into backwards compatible literal tag number, of course, and something that looks like a generic argument. So it uses the, the generic argument uh, angle brackets. Uh, so you can write a spec like this. Um, so, uh, well, this number six syntax, such as that. And then you can put in the tag number here. And, uh, well, yeah, just write normal uh, CDDL. And just to remind people how we are using angle brackets. Uh, I actually used an example here that uses angle brackets and its generics uh, semantics as well. So this looks, uh, seems to be a very small patch. And my main issue here is that I'm not quite sure yet how we are going to package this. Is this going to be a separate document which we just move independently of everything else or do we package this with other uh, stuff it's the first time we have seen a need to actually change the syntax uh, since RFC 8610. Brendan. Just from a consistency perspective, if we're looking at changing the, uh, the thing following the dot to a, uh, a non-literal, it just feels very strange to me that we're exposing the major type of the tag to the left of the dot. I would think there'd be a, a cleaner way to represent that. I mean, six, the only reason six says tag to me is because I know the major type. I shouldn't need to know that. Right. Well, yeah, the, 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 this reflects another mistake that we have made that uh, we probably cannot fix, uh, which is that only for number six, this is the actual argument. And for, the, for all the other cases, it's the additional information. 
So when you say 7.25, that doesn't mean that you have an argument of 25. It means you're using additional information 25 with seven. So you have a half precision floating point number. This is, yeah, I, I, I don't see a way to, to fix this without actually opening that wound <laughs> further. So I would propose we do this just for. <laughs> yeah, this this whole business of actually putting a CDDL on 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 its feet, touching the ground, is pretty ad hoc. It's not extensible. If if we wanted to do something that goes beyond JSON and. Uh, CBO, we probably would have to add something to this. So that, that is not the most beautiful part of CDL, but it's usually covered by the prelude. So you write int and, and not uh, hash zero or hash one, uh, except in this place where it actually shines through. I mean, we could invent a new syntax, uh, but then the next question would be, what, what do we use to identify tags as such? And, yeah, it's also something where I uh, get confused all the time when I write uh, hash six in CBO diagnostic <laughs> notation or leave out the, the hash six in CDDL. So this is not beautiful. I, I agree with that. But we need something that that kind of switches the parser into a different mode before we get these angle brackets, or we will have all kinds of syntactic. Uh, problems. So hash six. Okay. Yeah. So if, if anybody has an idea of, of how we would package this as, as a one paragraph RFC or whether we package this with anything else, I think there are people who want this pretty uh, quickly. So that would say one paragraph RFC. Unless we find anything else there that needs to be changed in the base syntax of, of the language, but I'm not currently aware of anything. Okay, next slide. So the one thing that is pretty fundamental, but that we have already started to extend in one or the other way is the processing model. So most people who do schema languages actually want to use these schema languages for validation. Uh, and uh, RFC 8610 essentially tells you when does a CBO instance match or JSON instance uh, match a CDDL specification. So this is the validation model you essentially apply the model to the data and you get yes or no. And that's all, Boolean value. In RFC 9165, we already extended this by adding the concept of features. So now you get yes or no, plus a list of features that have been used uh, in the match. So that there are some, uh, how do I put this? Um, it's not necessarily entirely clear whether there is always a deterministic answer to this question, but uh, unless you you try to be adversarial when you write your model, uh, this this pretty much works. So uh, other schema languages have uh, something called a post schema validation instance or PSVI uh, that actually changes the data that have been validated, for instance, by adding default values. So CDL does have a dot .default, but that does something slightly different. Uh, so that would be one thing we could do, <clears throat> but uh, we, we could also do uh, more uh, changes to the, the uh, input that are kind of orthogonal and what the CDDL tool, for instance, does internally 
is to annotate the instance with the rules that actually were used in, in matching. So when the CDDL tool, the, the original one that I wrote, uh, there are other tools by now, of course, uh, but the, the tool that is called lowercase CDDL, when that uh, has validated an instance, then you know which rules were applied. And that's actually useful for, for an annotated output, uh, which the tool can generate. But it turns out there is a lot of noise uh, in such a, uh, an instance uh, because, well, you have uh, things like some, something equals text string and uh, then something else uh, equals this or something else. So you get a lot of rules that are annotated on top of an item and the, the mechanism that is used in the CDDL tool to select one of those rules for the actual annotation is not very smart. So it would be nice if the model actually had a way to say, well, the fact that this rule was used is really important. And the fact that, that this in the end was mapped to text string, that, was not, that is not so important. So that would be the kind of annotation that we would add in the model to uh, have the validation process add uh, data that go beyond the generic data model of, of CBOL that allow you to do something uh, with uh, the validated instance. And um, annotations, we don't have to reinvent them because RelaxNG provides them. So we probably will do something that is quite similar to what RelaxNG does. And then we have uh, an instance that is still the original instance that came in. So there are no changes to the actual SIBO or the uh, JSON, but there are additional, there is additional information in terms of annotations that can be used by the implementation that is using a past instance to, to do something. And of course, the next step then is to think about transformation. So uh, for instance, if you have something in a structure that, that's only there to distinguish different cases, uh, you might want to remove that from the uh, validated instance because you, have, you now have the annotation, what, what it is. You no longer need this, this syntactical noise. Uh, for instance, when, uh, well, I'm, I'm going occasionally going to switch to A, B, and F and then to CDDL because they are so similar. similar. Um, I, I have an A, B, and F tool that, that, has, uh, that, that is being used in particular for implementing CDDL because it's a language and a typical item where this is being used is when you have a string, uh, you want to get rid of the quotes because the quotes are not part of the string. But you also want to transform all the escaped stuff in the string to what is actually meant by that. So that's a typical thing you might want to do in the transformation. Uh, and that's something that, that we could include in the uh, processing model. I would certainly want to have that in ABNF. It's, a bit less necessary in CBOR because there are so many ways in CBOR to express things uh, in a, a more semantic uh, level. Anyway, let's talk about annotations. Next slide. And I give the microphone to Bobby. Hello, um, I'm Brendan. Um, so at the hackathon, I uh, continued some work I started quite some time ago on generating a C pull parser definition directly from CDDL. Um, so what I have essentially is a combination code plus schema-ish, if you squint at it hard enough, data structure. And it, uh, it doesn't parse the whole block of Seaboard directly into a data structure. Instead, it just consumes the values it needs when it needs them. So it kind of iterates through the Seaboard structure as it needs the bits that are in it. Um, this is specifically designed for suit, but could be applied elsewhere. Um, so 
it, it has a few things that it does um, that, that make it quite convenient in that kind of use case. It evaluates uh, keys and types to make sure that it's uh, getting what it expects to have. Um, it also has some guidance elements that it extracts from the CDDL. Now those guidance flags are um, essentially what's used to control my parser. So I can repeat elements, mark them as optional, unwrap some Seabore inside a byte string, um, pass whatever I found to a handler function or handle key value pairs, which essentially nests down to another level. Um, it's quite efficient for what it is. Uh, but it's a bit of a pain to generate it from CDDL as it is today. And the, the, the key things that I see as missing are first off entry points. And I'll, I'll, I've got another slide that gives a bit more of an example about that. But essentially what entry points are, are suppose that you have multiple subcomponents of a CDDL structure that you might want to handle individually. Um, you've got one choice for that today, and that is to put them all in a top level type choice. And that's okay, except that in my scenario, I may know already which one I'm going to encounter, and putting them in that top level type choice, in my scenario at least, would require each of these elements to be tagged to be able to differentiate between them. So I would very much prefer to have a concept that I've called entry points, which is where I can tell, it, maybe it's something that doesn't belong in CDDL itself, I'm willing to accept that, but I definitely need to be able to tell my generator which things I might want to pull out. And so from that perspective, if everyone has to do that, it looks to me like it belongs in CDDL. Um, I would like to have annotations for my parser to, to tell it when something is gonna need to be handled directly, maybe in a slightly different way, instead of just continuing to extract into a data structure. So for that, essentially what I'm saying is a handler function name. I've also said that I might want to extract a variable that might just be specific to, to my use case. It might not be generic, so maybe it doesn't belong here. I don't know, that's for the working group. Um, and then there's a the question of entry point dependent handling. Suit's got one specific use case, which is interesting in this, where I need to extract the sequence number of a manifest before I do any validation on it, because if it's too late, or if it's an old one, there's no point in even validating its signature. It's too old, I won't touch it. If it is valid, then yes, I'll go through and, and, and validate its signature, but if it's too old, I don't even wanna look at it. So, um, in that scenario, I treat a whole bunch of things as opaque objects that I would otherwise unpack. And so there it would be convenient to essentially have two variations where either I unwrap byte strings or I don't. Um, ordered multi-maps are a really big deal for me because I'm encoding key value pairs in an array because I need to repeat them and not have them reordered on me. And that's the only way that I can do that in, in, in Seabor, and there's no way to represent that in CDDL as it stands today. What this means is that I have a separate data structure that lives in parallel to the CDDL, which says these are the names of the types which contain ordered multi-maps so that my code generator can identify them correctly. Um, and of course, as Karsten mentioned, imports. Imports are a really big deal. Because I don't have imports today, what I have to do is fetch copies of the CDDL, which for Cozy, let me tell you, is not straightforward, especially because of the trailing character that floated in there somehow. Um, and then I have to concatenate all the CDDL together and because of the way I'm doing it, I can't even strip out the, the elements of Cozy that I don't want. And so they get sucked into my uh, code generator as well, which I would really prefer if I didn't have. If I could have fine-grained imports, I could get rid of a lot of that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so an example for where annotations might make sense, imagine a challenge response protocol where the challenge and the response are different messages. The responder knows that it receives challenges, it doesn't receive responses. It does not need to choose which of these types it's parsing against. So 
if, when I talk about entry points, you can think of the responder receiving challenges as its entry point into there. It will only need to parse a challenge. It does not need to parse a response. So from that perspective, having an entry point to the challenge simplifies the responder. Um, I mentioned that there's suit not using every structure in COSY. Um, and annotations could be used to strip that. Yes, uh, I think that's all I have. So there you go, whirlwind tour. Uh, any questions? No? Yeah, I have a question in five minutes, which is whether the things that are on the slide actually solve your problem. Um, yeah, so uh, let, let's talk about solutions uh, 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 briefly. We, we did that at the last interim. Um, as well, but I hadn't made uh, slides for those, so uh, maybe it's a good idea to run through these again. Um, so as Brendan said, in CDA 1.0, we build our larger models by concatenating uh, little modules um, in an intelligent way, and which files need to go into the, the whole model Real is information that lives into externally and then the make file or something like that. And in CDL 2.0, we want to have explicit references, but we also want to be able to just feed some CDL 2.0 uh, file to a CDL 1.0 processor and have that do something useful so people can continue to use their code generators and so on until these are also updated. So here's the kind of syntax that I'm proposing to add these module superstructure components. So as you can see, this is a conventional comment. It's a semicolon, it's a comment character in CDDL that's from ABNF, which was designed in 1977. And if you were around in 1977, then semicolon may be a very familiar comment character to you. Right now, most people I think the hash mark is a common character and well, I just combined semicolon and hash mark here. So this is, this would be an export statement, which is pretty much, well, I don't know if it's the same, but it's related to what you call entry points. Uh, so the uh, module exported from RFC 1990 would say there are three entry points object ID, relative object ID, and private enterprise number. And uh, these are the three ones that you are supposed to use. You can get at the others, so this is not trying to be a data encapsulation or something like that. Uh, but the, these are the three ones that are supposed to uh, be used more often. Next slide. So yeah, uh, one kind of reference Oh, should I should have put this slide later, but it's okay. One kind of reference that we often have to do is look into an IANA registry. So I didn't use the conventional comment here because that, that doesn't work. You, you have to uh, go right into the CDA here. So let's say that uh, the, the Cozy algorithm is an inter integer for which IANA has an entry in the COSI registry, in the algorithm sub-registry, and there in the column value. I just spent half an hour talking with IANA people on how likely this is going to be supported in the future. I mean, it works today because I just have to throw this X path at the <laughs> registry. Uh, but uh, yeah, this, this uses um, internal interfaces that I'm not supposed to, to use. So uh, we need to find, a, uh, to do this, we need to um, find time to actually work with IANA on doing this. And we actually have to finish the dereferential identifier draft that explains that you are not doing this each time you uh, switch on a light. <laughs> there is something that may be helpful here that doesn't reach inside the internal uh, things that you're not supposed to access. There's also a CSV file for each of these registries. Yes. Not sure that everything is in there. But yeah, that, that, that's useful input. 
Has somebody invented extra for CSVs yet? <laughs> you know that there is actually a, a, a draft about CDDL for CSVs. So if you ever have to specify a CSV, you, you know how to do a CDDL. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so th this is the direction here. This will take some time because we have to talk with IANA, develop common ideas about what the interfaces are. They will have to implement these interfaces. So we're probably talking about a year or so until this actually uh, works. So maybe we should push this out again to a separate uh, document. But I think this is really uh, useful in particular also when you don't want to hard code in your file that minus 27 means this particular variant of using AES, uh, then I think uh, you win with this. Yeah, and you, you are probably already guessed that I want to do the same thing for ABNF at, at some point. Uh, so that, that's again something that, that we need to understand. Next slide. So here's the really minimal way to do an RFC reference. So uh, if you say, I want the integer from RFC 8610, this is the syntax for this. When we define CDDL, we kept quite a few special characters in the identifier uh, syntax. So we could use more characters here, but I think that, that actually works. And of course, the, the implementation would be that if something is not defined uh, in the CDL uh, file, you don't throw an error right away, but you look at it whether it's a valid uh, referencing uh, syntax. And by the way, one nice thing would be that we actually can put the prelude into a namespace and uh, yeah, we, we have to think about this, what this actually means, uh, but we have had clashes between the prelude and uh, things that people wanted to write uh, in specs and uh, would be nice to separate this a little bit out. Even if the prelude is not supposed to change uh, uh, anymore. So you know there, there are like 36 reserved identifiers, uh, you cannot use it would be nice if this would be a smaller number. Okay, so th this is, uh, I think, a construct with high usability. Next slide. Uh, now, if we ever write something that, that, like RFC 1990 again, then we will have this export line there. So th this is a slightly simplified version of what is in RFC 1990. Um, and uh, this would actually declare that these are the three entries that uh, you're supposed to use. And until that is available, yeah, we, we can just uh, do this unadorned import mechanism. Or next slide, uh, we could, can do an export, uh, an explicit uh, import. So this is one of the conventional comments again. We say we actually want to import already from RFC 1990 and then we can use that without the prefix. Okay, this should work for RFCs, that's easy. It should work for internet drafts, but there of course we run into this problem. Versions are stupid. And uh, yeah, so we will have to spend some, some mental energy on uh, doing something here that uh, balances convenience and the potential for errors. Uh, but this should work, uh, maybe without the dot text, I don't know. And uh, you should be able to uh, take something out of, out of a draft. Yeah, and for the, RFC, for the old RFCs, uh, there would be an implicit assumption that uh, everything is exported from this RFC because we don't have the, the explicit entry point a statement. And one thing we could also do is uh, provide 
references into the document that are more detailed because many documents have a, an expositional part where you have chunks of CDDL and then you have consolidated CDDL in a section. You really want to pull the CDDL from that section. CDDL has this little trick where if you define something twice exactly the same way, that's okay. But uh, we can really rely that all drafts get this right. So this is this would be a way to be more specific about uh, using Annex D, Appendix D. Okay, so th these are the import and export uh, syntaxes. Oh yeah, so th this thing is called include. I don't know if include is, is smart. We can find names for these things. Uh, and essentially says, we are going to use the, the term time tag to reference things out of this graph. I forgot to say that. Okay, next slide. So what are the operations? We have the export mechanism that essentially adds a prefix to a local rule name and makes that namespace available to other specs. We have the import, which takes uh, things out of a namespace, maybe use as is, maybe unprefix uh, details to be defined. And we have the use or include uh, thing that uh, allows you to say where you actually can find that namespace. And that is a problem uh, because references out from a document always age very, very badly. Uh, so you, you really should not, not ever have references uh, from a document to something that is behind a URI or has a specific version number and so on. Uh, you really should be doing this in terms of namespaces but then it's, it's pretty convenient to be able to do this. So yeah, we, we, again, we probably have to balance convenience with correctness again uh, here. Okay, I think that's the main content. There's another slide, I think. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the, the, what I just said. So how do we find the document that exports a namespace I would like to be able to talk to about TS 25 point something, and then uh, the system have the system know that it has to go to some 3GPP repository and extract the Word document, convert that to Markdown, extract the CDDL from that, uh, and so on. So this, this would be convenience, uh, but the, the model spec should just talk about TS 25. Five point three four five. Uh, the inverse, of course, also can happen if you have a namespace and then the document gets split. <laughs> uh, yeah, then you have several documents and exporting into the same namespace. And we get all the problems with updates, revision versions, semantic versioning. Uh, there probably will be a twiddle worker in our lives at some point where you can say, I want to have at least version 2.2 of uh, OIDs, but not version three, because that might be too new for me. So 2.6 is fine, but 2.1 is not, and three is not either. Okay, last slide, I think. Yeah, um, I just wanted to remind people, ABNF is a lot like CDDL. So if we invent something here, that works for CDL, it's quite likely that this will work for ABNF as well. Well, certainly not the syntax for ANA references, but ABNF has other ways of doing that. So that would be a slight divergence, uh, but anything else we probably want to offer for ABNF, well, at least the ABNF that goes into our CDDL, uh, but uh, maybe also uh, for freestanding uh, ABNF. 
So, uh, yeah, we no longer are in the situation that people have to extract uh, parts of ABNF of some, some random uh, RFC to get their ABNF uh, statements uh, compiled. Okay, what are we missing? Chris Chan, go ahead. Christian, oh, we don't hear you. Yeah, not not getting any audio from. Do, do you do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, um, what are we missing? Looking at the at the annotations we had before, um, I think this might be missing uh, something on uh, whether something is mandatory to mandatory to understand or not. Because looking at Brandon's requirement list on describing things that then go into into particular data structures, um, if I were to take a CDDL document and map that to my data structure, that would be a piece of information I would otherwise have to add manually so that data structure can say, and this is potentially ignoring all, say, positive integer keys but not negative integer keys. And if that information could somehow be part of the annotations, I think this would be valuable. Although it could, of course, be feature dependent on whether something is mandatory to understand or not. Right now, my assumption would be that anything that is in a CDL spec is mandatory to understand. Uh, so are you looking for something to say this is not mandatory to understand? This mandatory to understand would be something opt outish, but if the CDL explicitly said there is this and that, say, extension point, and this is marked as not mandatory to understand, then something building a parser from the CDL into a particular data structure would know from all the metadata in the CDL that it can ignore particular branches, whereas regularly, unlike some JavaScript conventions, things that are not known are a pausing error. Okay, I would like to, to marry this with the dot feature mechanism in some way. Yes. So maybe, maybe we can find some semantics that actually work with this together. Um, Karsten, I'm gonna have to, I, I can't agree with you on the mandatory to understand point. Uh, if I have a parser that understands cozy sign and doesn't understand cozy Mac, that's totally legitimate. And that was Brendan Moran. Yeah. Um, this is Hank. We um, switched order here. <laughs> no sequence. Um, so my answer to Carson's questions is I don't know. And if anybody remembers the question, so um, a couple of minutes. And um, but there's something that would be uh, in in strong relationship to what Brent was what wants to do, and that's an IDL. So if we do the annotation and uh, the code generation points that help us to do that, uh, we could further annotate them and and get that thing going. I know we are in the mood of breaking things apart into multiple uh, documents. I think that's the theme of this presentation here right now. <clears throat> that could be something that then builds on the first step of annotation. And I uh, think that a lot of people would like to do work on that today, but they do not know where to start. And that's Brandon's work uh, input, sorry, from the from the uh, uh, first experience doing the uh, suit manifest pull pause thing and uh, generating, making that easier, his life easier, everybody's life easier. And, and then maybe we can break off from that uh, something that would uh, be annotation for that. I think that is my only request that they plan for that when we break that out. Yeah. I think th th there is some, something interesting going on here. Um, so putting all this information into one CDDA specification doesn't quite work because we, we, we want to have a CDA specification that actually, we actually agree on in a standard. And we don't have to agree on the variable name for, for something to extract to. 
Um, so uh, we need to find a way uh, to actually add to some CDDL in a way that it survives if that CDDL evolves in some form. Um, and yeah, this is not a new subject at all. We have that everywhere. I mean, CSS was designed to add to HTML. So we know how to do that in principle. Uh, we just have to make sure this is actually, this works in, in our specific uh, uh, context. So I think that that's a pretty important observation. Um, I will throw a time check in here that we, uh, we do need a few minutes to yeah. handle the DNS. Um, I'll, I'll just say that that is effectively the solution that I've taken. I'm doing exactly what you've described. It's just not in the context of CDDL directly. So um, I guess I agree. Good. In which case, you know that there is a mailing list and, and you actually can use that and throw ideas there. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we will have a lot of nice interims in the ne next uh, few months that actually look at specific parts of this and uh, we can develop it from them. And now I can give the microphone to Martin. Uh, I don't see the slides here yet, so. Okay, I guess I just let you control it. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Martin. Uh, I talk about uh, DNS message representation in Seabor. Um, most of this talk I already gave in uh, on Monday and also a little bit during the interim. Uh, yeah, so maybe we can skip over some of the slides for time reasons. Okay, the motivation mainly is that uh, with, uh, for example, 800.215.4, but also with uh, the LP1 networks, we uh, run quickly into fragmentation depending on the name size, even for very short names with an port A record. If we use DNS over co-op, uh, we run into fragmentation. You can see this in these graphs where on the x-axis we see the queries and the responses, and on the y-axis we see the packet size and the uh, dash lines marking the fragmentation borders. Uh, so we need some way of compressing DNS messages, which is basically what we're trying to do here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> next slide. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, so the objective is to reduce the packet size of DNS queries and replies. And uh, yeah, we want to encode this in CBOR and omit DN, uh, redundant DNS fields and uh, in the DNS queries and responses, and also want to pro uh, use address and name uh, compression using packed CBOR, which uh, we decided to make it optional. So even parsers that don't support uh, packed CBOR can work with that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we already got from our discussions in core. Uh, some feedback from DNS op um, that the concise format might hamper future DNS extensions, but there are possible ways already to address this. Um, one way, uh, at least on the record uh, resource record label uh, level, is to have unstructured resource records just as a byte string. Um, I will go into this in, at a later point. And uh, also with content no negotiations, we can always, for example, fall back to the wire format, uh, which is still not off the table. Uh, if you have any more thoughts on that, how to uh, improve that, uh, please uh, give feedback there. Um, next slide, please. So we go straight into the DNS query. Um, this is basically at the moment still the same that as I presented at the interim. Um, so the DNS name is just a text string and you can add optional IDs and record types. Next slide, please. Um, in for, uh, resulting from the core discussions, um, this, there's a problem that this currently doesn't support eDNS zero because uh, we can't have an additional section with this at the moment. So no way to add the sudo RRs for the eDNS zero uh, uh, options. And then is also the question, if we want to support it, uh, there is no way to express DNS stateful operations since 
it uh, no opcode op is present and the sections counts aren't a thing in our format. Uh, and uh, DNS uh, staple operations is, are expressed as TLVs. So how to express this here? Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, for the resource records, again, going back to that, um, basically, this is also, again, like in the interim, uh, a CBOR array, which is minimum contains a TTL and the resource data and an optional name and record spe type specification, which then would be just taken from the question if they are not present. Next slide, please. Again, from the discussions that already happened, um, the question is here, maybe what I've uh, said before, uh, also provides a possibility to provide the resource record just as a byte string, uh, where we would just use the wire format of that record. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, to represent then a response, that would be an array of arrays where each array would be an array of DNS resource records uh, representing a section. Um, again, uh, we generally assume that the transport can map the queries to the response, which is both the case for uh, DOC and DOH. Um, uh, but uh, if, there, if that's not the case, the original question and ID may be amended optional. Next slide, please. And here again from the discussions, uh, in stateful operations are also here missing somehow. And um, there are also a few fields that are completely ignored because for doc, we didn't need them really, but maybe it still makes sense to include them like the opcodes, R code and flex. Uh, next slide, please. And so just to give an example how well the compression works at this old format, which probably will change a little bit, um, but not that much bytes added then, hopefully. Um, we can compress a query by 400% and a response by 283%. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for a more complex example, uh, where I gave this DNS SD uh, 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 example, next slide, please. We have the problem that uh, the con concise format is a little bit larger than the original format. So we need some, uh, we had the idea to add some address and name compression. Uh, and for that, we use the CBO pack format. Next slide, please. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, uh, that uh, then we uh, we can use by adding to the media type the parameter pack one. This is not the case in draft zero, uh, zero 01 at the moment where it's its own media type, but it will be in zero 02. Um, and uh, then also make the shared value and argument table one list because we only need the prefix and suffix compression from SIBO packed. So uh, I don't, we don't see a problem to uh, make them one list. And um, yeah, uh, then we basically have this CDDL, maybe also something for the CDDL2 thing. I wasn't sure if this is possible to express this in CDDL, uh, how to com how a compressed response would work. Um, yeah, and uh, the response then becomes just another CBOR array of two arrays with the packing table, which is the combined shared value and argument table and the compressed DNS response, which basically follows the same structure as before, but just that every values are then, that the values are then compressed according to SIBO pact. Next slide, please. And if we look then at the example I had before, instead of 200 bytes, we then have 119 bytes, which is a compression rate of 146, uh, 64%. Um, yeah, last slide. Should now come. Oh no, okay, so some overlay. Yeah, um, we can add some uh, implied DNS specific table entries, for example, TLDs, uh, so that you can um, have uh, them maybe compressed but not mentioned in the packing table, so that you can even save even some more bytes for common values, such as, for example, TLDs. Um, now, the last slide. Um, so the question is, especially regarding the query, if we might need to get back to the board, drawing board if we want to support, for example, DSOs, but also DN EDNS zero, uh, or do we keep it as is and just say, if uh, you want to use these features, 
use the application DNS message format as a fallback, um, which uh, given that uh, messages that use options or uh, DNS stateful operations might become more complex anyways, might be a viable way to handle this. And yeah, uh, for the next version, we also need some uh, more work on the packed seaboard, uh, specifically uh, how the uh, packing table is to be constructed. And um, also, uh, yeah, uh, this idea with a global compression context where you might use a TLD or something like that uh, implicitly, um, we also need uh, some, to put some work into that. Are there any questions or comments on your side? Yes, Carsten? The, the first RFC I uh, contributed to was about compression and <clears throat> I have worked on various forms of compression since occasionally. There is always this, this urge to get that other 1%. Mm. And I think we have to be very careful that we don't fall victim to that and uh, do the things that actually are meaningful uh, and can be implemented with, with uh, limited uh, effort uh, and not try to be that last 1% uh, better afterwards. So that would be my recommendation in uh, further developing this. If something falls out with, without a lot of effort because it's yeah, no complexity, let's do it. Let's not try to do things that come to mind, but then turn out to be really complicated. Okay, yep. Uh, and to sign this, uh, <laughs> I agree with, with this basically also. So uh, yeah, um, but especially with EDNS0, maybe this is still something to consider for DSO at least for DOC, there is already something that we proposed how to avoid them. So uh, yeah, um, any further comments? Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, Martin. thank you. Um, all right, is, uh, I, I guess we uh, do not have time to discuss the remaining thing on the agenda, we can save that for the first for the first um, interim. Uh, we I, I discussed with Marco um, uh, the interim schedule to coordinate with this with the core group. We're going to keep the same cadence that we had. We just need to figure out when we want to restart. Should we have one in December or just wait until January to restart? Does anyone have? a preference on that. I see no preferences. I'll just take it to the mailing list then. So with that, I guess uh, we will call it a meeting. Thank you, everybody. Have a good trip home. Thank you. Bye. Ja, ja, ja. 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 Ja, ja, ja.